everyone to the, this uh, appointment with the focus meeting of the GGIT Brex. Uh, I would like to thank the speakers, uh, Daniel Schulte and Lianta Wang for accepting to, to give the, the talk and after to, to answer the question of the discussion. And I imagine that we have a very uh, interesting discussion after the talks. And uh, okay, I just leave to David the introduction of the first, the, the first speaker and uh, enjoy, enjoy the talks. Thank you, Stefania. So welcome to everybody, hello. And um, so uh, this idea of building this uh, high energy muon collider actually has received a lot of interest uh, in the last uh, two years, uh, after probably after the European strategy update and uh, snow mass uh, efforts in the US. And so, um, I think this is really an exciting opportunity for high energy physics, uh, both for theorists and experimentalists. And uh, we are very happy today to have, uh, very lucky to have uh, two experts in, in this topic. Uh, so Daniel Schulte and uh, Elian Tao Wang um, to tell us uh, everything about these, uh, uh, these projects. Um, so we, we are going to start with uh, Daniel Schulte. Uh, he's an experimentalist uh, from uh, CERN. Uh, he completed the PhD in uh, 1996 at DAISY uh, on the det detector backgrounds for future linear colliders. Uh, and since then, I think uh, he worked uh, at CERN, first as a fellow and then uh, as a staff member, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And um, so during his career, he worked on uh, actually many different accelerators and collider projects uh, from uh, uh, linear collider, uh, ILC and CLIC uh, to circular collider, uh, LHC and uh, FCCHH. Uh, uh, in, he led, he was one, one of the leaders for uh, machine design studies for uh, CLIC and FCCHH. Uh, and now he is uh, again one of the leaders of the newly, I think, newly born uh, International Muon Collider Collaboration. And uh, so uh, I leave the chat uh, to Daniel. Uh, please, uh, uh, thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. I just said the two minutes, I was the second speaker. So. Um... Okay, so thanks for this opportunity to uh, present the Muon Collider. Um, and oh, I see the. Uh, so, um, first, because you, you certainly heard about the fact that the Muon Collider existed, or in some states existed in the US uh, some years ago, and there were actually also activities uh, in Italy uh, on an alternative scheme lemma and uh, some experimental activity in the UK on mice. Um, so, why did uh, the, the interest in Muon Collider spark again? In Europe. And there were two main changes uh, compared to uh, the, the last P5 a few years ago. One is the change of goals. Um, the current champion at high energy uh, lepton collisions is CLIC with 3TV, which has been optimized for decades and uh, which will cost something like 18 uh, giga Swiss francs and use 600 megawatts of power. Now, the idea is that actually the Muon Collider can go higher, like to 10 TV at an affordable cost and power consumption. So maybe less than like a three. We will have to see if uh, we get there. Um, so, but it's really this very high energy. And then the other one is that technology and design has advanced since um, in the last uh, few years. That means uh, superconducting magnet technology has improved with HDS becoming a, a real option, actually commercially available from industry. Uh, there's a better design of the cooling channel and uh, there is uh, some progress on specific technologies. I will come back to that in the talk. And because of that, CERN allocated some budget and initiated a collaboration, uh, which is now uh, starting to, to work uh, towards the Mion Collider. And actually, we are also trying to help the US colleagues to, to enter the field. There's lots of interest. And so maybe with the current SNOMAS process, they can actually join us in larger numbers. In case you did not see, the uh, design, this is the proton-driven uh, muon collider. Um, so what uh, it consists of uh, a proton complex where you have a something like a two megawatt uh, proton beam, which you accelerate, that's not a big uh, challenge, but then you compress the proton beam into uh, individual bunches. So you need uh, to create five high uh, charge bunches per second. And each of these bunches you send into a target where they produce pions. Uh, the positive and negative pions then uh, decay into muons, and you collect the muons in a decay channel, 
and uh, then you bunch them and you rotate them in phase space. That's a detail. And then you start cooling them in metric because you have no time as the muon lifetime is so, so short. And after that, uh, you X-ray the muons uh, from very low energy, high energy, first in Linux, and then you go into a system of uh, rings. And at full energy, in the end, you uh, inject the beam into a, a collider ring with high field magnets so that you get as many collisions out of the muons before they decay as possible. All of that would be totally straightforward if it were not for the limited muon lifetime. So we will hear uh, about the physics afterwards, so we'll not say much. Um, but certainly a high energy lepton collider is a discovery machine as much as a precision machine. And what is important for us is that something of, in the range of 10 to 14 TV would actually roughly match a 100 TV hadron collider and then people dispute for different physics channels uh, the relative advantages. And then the other important uh, goal for us is that the luminosity of the collider actually increases with the center of mass energy squared. So with S, um, as we go up in energy, because the cross-section goes as one over S, and therefore we want to have the same number of events at all energies. So that's an important goal for the machine. It, it's difficult enough to give you high energy, but the, you, you also want the high luminosity. After. So what is the specific promise of the muon collider? Why is it so interesting? If you look at click, I think that's pretty much what you can do with the linear colliders after uh, quite uh, sort of important research. And um, you see here uh, the luminosity of a click uh, as a function of the center of mass energy. And the luminosity is normalized to the beam power. So that gives you a rough indication of how much uh, power you need in order to get your luminosity. And you see that this is a constant. It's a flat curve. It actually goes slightly down at high energy. And that is theoretically totally understood. I could show you the formula uh, that lead to that, but it is expected like that. And uh, it becomes a little more difficult at high energy because of synchrotron radiation appearing in a linear collider in the focusing systems. Um, in contrast, the muon collider has, here this is based on the map uh, numbers on the map uh, parameter sets, the luminosity per beam power that increases linearly with energy. And that is also understood. It is, if you can preserve the longitudinal phase space in the acceleration, then you can make a bunch of short at high energy and you can squeeze them more at high energy. And so uh, this is a very beneficial scaling, which is unique. I'm not aware of any other collider that has that feature. In a proton collider, for example, you, you are limited by the fact that protons decay all the time, uh, are destroyed in the collision all the time. Um, the other advantage are that the, the size is relatively compact, so a 10 TV, a uh, muon collider is comparable in size to a 3 TV click. If you take the main Linux tunnel and bend it around, you get the um, somewhat more than the uh, longest accelerator ring for the muon collider. Staging is natural. You, you do it in rings. So you add another ring for a new higher energy. It's hopefully cost effective. Indications are there, but we don't have a full uh, cost estimate yet um, because you can reuse components like you accelerate in ring to go through the same RF multiple times. And it has also some synergies on the way. So that's why we think the muon collider is uniquely uh, uh, suited for high energies and with high luminosity, unlike other technologies. Um, these are the goals. The integrated luminosity is for three energies on the left-hand side. Uh, we consider doing uh, two stages, so it could be a 3 TV and then 10 or 14 TV. We wouldn't build it in three stages to get to 14 TV, I think. And you see the scaling is indeed perfect with, uh, with S. It should be 0.9 at 3 TV, but we round it up to one. And then you can compare the parameters here. And you see those would actually achieve the integrated luminosity within five years in a single detector. And if you look at the beam power of a 14 TV muon collider, it is 20 megawatts, the power injected in the collider ring. And click at 3 TV, it's 28 megawatts. So you see, this is really where the muon collider shines. Okay. Uh, there is an international collaboration working on the muon collider. There is a memorandum of cooperation that uh, institutes can sign. Also, funding agencies can sign that. Um, this uh, uh, collaboration is hosted at CERN. Uh, this can be given to another institute later if somebody else wants to, to build the collider. And uh, the goal is to establish whether the investment into a full conceptual design and a demonstrator for the muon collider is scientifically justified, focusing on 10 TV as the 
uh, energy goal that we set ourselves to to still be realistic. I mean, we, we could explore higher energies, but we wanted something that seems also cost and power consumption wise a realistic step and 3 TV as an intermediate step with uh, potentially uh, less ambitious uh, technology so it could be realized faster and then we will explore synergies. A number of institutes have yet signed, uh, not all of them, so some are still in the process, uh, so, so the letters go back and forth and some uh, express that they want to sign but haven't signed yet. So there's INFN, very important, and there is uh, CR, uh, ESS, uh, the directors agree they would sign rather for them, told, uh, I don't know, the, the letter is somewhere still hanging in the administration and then some, uh, quite a number of universities, uh, I have is there, for example, also. Okay. Um, now, what are the collaborators doing? So first, let's look at the luminosity um, expressed in the beam parameters. So what you see here is the luminosity proportional, forget about the uh, constant we have here, to the beam uh, energy, so to gamma. That's what I showed before. Then it is the magnetic field in the collider ring. So we want high field magnets there. Uh, the property of the collider ring lattice, which is the energy acceptance, uh, the, the wider the energy spread can be in this ring, the shorter we can make the bunch and the more we can focus the beam. So that we assume does not change with energy. If you can. And then we have the charge of the bunch divided by the transverse times launch emittance. This is the brilliance of the, the, the quality of the beam. And then we have actually here the uh, rep uh, repetition rate, so number of bunches per second, uh, the charge in each bunch and the energy of the bunch. So this here is the power in the beam. And so if you increase the power, we always get more luminosity, that's true in all, or if you increase the quality of the beam. So now we will uh, actually have to face, we want to improve the quality as much as possible to use as little power as uh, possible. So the key challenges are, first the physics potential, the assessment there, this is ongoing, but there's still this sort of, you can see that things progress from uh, meeting to meeting. And then there is uh, the neutrino flux, which can be very dense from the collidering. I'll come back to that. That could impact uh, the site uh, opportunities for the muon collider. And uh, the beam induced background, which is certainly critical in order to realize the physics potential. So with that, uh, I will not cover in uh, uh, much detail. And then in order to achieve the high energies, we have to look into the high energy complex. Uh, which is mainly the driver for the, post, uh, for the cost and power consumption of the, the complex. So you have uh, superconducting magnets here, you have uh, an accelerator ring, the fast ramping magnets. And so that will limit how far you can go in energy. While the injector complex in our model is the same at all energies, and this drives the quality of the beam. So the US did quite some work on that. But there is more to be done in order to improve the system and to actually make it complete and uh, there's still quite some room to, to, to work here. But since much has been done there, it's certainly more difficult to make progress here uh, while uh, this high energy scaling is sort of the critical part that has not been looked into in the MAP study. They limited themselves more or less to three TV with series studies. So let's go through the complex and look at the challenges one after the other. So the first is the proton driver. And there it's not really the power of the proton beam. Two megavolts is like, bread and butter nowadays, almost. <laughs> I should not say that, but it, it's like uh, a standard. The DCL at five megawatts, uh, Zurin and the ESS can do that. Um, so the challenge in this is actually the combination of the uh, sort of pulses of protons into a single bunch in an accumulator, in a buncher, and then a combiner set. And so, so that needs to be looked at. And our ESS colleagues are uh, interested in doing that. And then we have a two megawatt proton beam going into a target. What is shown here is actually a liquid target of mercury, just because the plot was available. But we would uh, want a graphite target, a solid target. And um, this um, produces radiation in the target, which then actually we need to shield our magnets from. And it also will induce uh, some stress in the target. So that's a big challenge. Um, the shielding of the target, uh, of the, the solenoid around the target. So the solenoid is needed to uh, guide the particles longitudinally. Uh, needs to be very thick because the superconducting solenoid is sensitive. So that means it needs to have a large aperture and therefore that is a, is a big challenge. The field itself would not be a major challenge. 
So we can have a look at the target design. So there actually has been progress in the past uh, month. Uh, there are two options to consider. One is you have a superconducting roughly 15 Tesla outer solenoid. And then inside you have a resistive uh, solenoid. So the other one is superconducting. The inner one would be copper-based, hollow copper um, to boost the field up to 20 Tesla. And then you have the shielding in between. The other option you can consider is actually using an HTS solenoid, which makes the 20 Tesla right away. And so you don't need the inner one. You can put the shielding closer to the, to the beam uh, here. Um, now this type of magnet is ambitious, but here you see an example of a magnet um, model, which has been developed for ETA. And that has almost two meter aperture. So it's close to what we need and 13 Tesla. So, so this is an engineering challenge and we are not that far. We were even accused to, to be a little too conservative by some of the fusion people. I'm not sure this is true, but what can I say? Um, and then there's the target itself. And there it's the shock of the proton beam going into the target. And you see here a simulation of that. And that indicates that two megawatts is probably acceptable and it might be on the limit of what can be done, but it is good enough for us. And it would operate actually the target at very high temperature because uh, graphite is more stable at higher temperatures than at lower temperatures. It's one of the, I think it's the only material I know of that actually becomes more robust as we go up in energy. After you produced the muons in the target, or actually in the decay after the target, you have to cool them. And this here shows you the development of the emittance after the target. So you have on the horizontal, the transverse emittance, and on the vertical axis, you have the longitudinal emittance. And you start with a hot beam at the target, and then you reduce it longitudinally, and then you go into the cooling that I will describe in a moment. So there's a first cooling stage. You reduce the emittance in both planes. You put a few bunches uh, together and you increase the intensity, but the, the emittance also goes up. Then you cool further down. And then at the very end, you now uh, go and you reduce the transverse emittance only and you let the longitudinal grow because you don't profit so much from having a shorter bunch because it's difficult to take advantage of that, but you profit very much from having a, a transversely smaller bunch. And so this is the final cooling. So that's the path. And the scheme functions as follows. I show the final cooling because it's easiest to understand. You will start with a bunch of particles with large uh, angles. Uh, you see them here. And so you see here uh, the transverse momentum or the, the momentum of the particle, a longitudinal component and a transverse component. And then you send the bunch through some material. Uh, liquid hydrogen is a perfect uh, material or hydrogen gas at high pressure. And you lose energy by ionization. And you see here, you lose actually momentum in the uh, direction of motion. So transverse and longitudinal momentum. And after that, you re-accelerate the beam to its initial energy. So you replace only longitudinal momentum and the transverse is reduced. So that's the principle, it's very easy. And you see here, there's the formula of the emittance uh, evolution. There is this cooling term. So, so the emittance becomes smaller, uh, which is related to the energy loss. But then there is a heating term. And that is just multiple scattering. That obviously gives new angles to the particles. And at some point, the two will be equal. And so you have equilibrium and you cannot cool anymore. The heating term depends on the beta function, um, which is a beam physics quantity. Um, and the beta function depends, is related to the bunch uh, size transversely. And that depends on the field in which the collision uh, with, with the uh, absorber takes place. So you have a solenoid around the absorber to focus the beam to keep it small. And the beta function is proportional to the inverse of the magnetic field. And so you see, if you uh, make a very strong field here, you reduce the beta function and you reduce uh, the multiple scattering term, the heating term. So you want the strongest solenoids that you can get for uh, your money around the absorbers at the final cooling. Uh, this is just to show, um, how that functions here, the equilibrium emittance depends on um, the radiation length of the material and the energy loss per unit length at the energy at which you are with your muons, one over the magnetic field, and then on gamma, which is in the cooling, it's almost close to one. We, we are so sort of, it's a not very relativistic uh, muon. And you see here, this is the uh, beta uh, Bloch formula. Actually, at high energies, we would lose uh, more rapidly energy, but that doesn't matter 
because this is uh, stochastic. So, so th there we have uh, strong fluctuations between particles. So we do most of the cooling actually at minimum ionization, where you see that also the energy of the particle doesn't change its loss very much. And then in the final cooling, we go to very small muon energies. So, so we get lots of uh, cooling, lots of energy loss. But the problem is that in this slope, you see that a high energy muon loses less energy than a low energy muon. So the muon beam energy spread increases because, um, and that's why we do that only at the very end. Now let's look at the solenoids. Um, we would like to have, well, we would like to have the highest field that's possible. And uh, what has been demonstrated uh, many times is uh, 30 Tesla. So 30 Tesla would lead to that is roughly close to our goals. So, so we, we, with the beam dynamics design, we, we could maybe achieve that. But ideally, we would want to go to higher fields. And you see here some solenoids, some test solenoids that actually push it uh, even to 45. But you see that there are many around uh, 30. And here you have a plot, a theoretical plot of how far you could push the solenoids. And they are limited by stress. So, so what you have here is the horizontal, horizontal magnetic field. And then you have here lines uh, that correspond to the same amount of stress. And you can go up to this level here. You see that in principle, we should be able to operate solenoids at 60 Tesla. Now that certainly is a technology development to be done, but that would, uh, uh, it's something that we will try to, to push as far as possible. Then we have the 60 cooling, which is the bulk of the cooling, the, the very long part. So, so with a few hundred uh, magnets and uh, cavities, um, so you see a string here. Um, you see we have RF cavities to accelerate the beam, the absorbers, and we have actually the solenoids close to the RF because we want this to be very compact because we lose in a drift here, we would lose uh, muons. And uh, initially we have smaller fields uh, and large apertures, and then we go to um, very high fields in the absorber and making this very compact. And obviously this is an engineering challenge to put all of this together as close as possible. And you see in this one, I think there, we needed somewhat more space uh, in this design. So, so that needs to be really engineered. And the system length is critical for the performance. And there is an additional problem. Uh, I just want to illustrate that because it's not maybe so, so obvious to everybody, that if you put RF into a strong magnetic field, the RF doesn't like that, especially with the solenoid. And why is that? Um, you know that if you put voltage if you put energy into the cavity, you generate this longitudinal uh, field. And what can happen is that the uh, cavity sparks. So it creates like a flash and is shortened. And that is because you have electrons that are escaping from a rough spot on the surface. And then they uh, go across the cavity and hit the other side. And if this density becomes too high, then you get like an avalanche. Now, uh, this is in a normal cavity and that gives you some limit. But then, and the limit depends on the surface. But when you start extracting, when these here start extracting more electrons, then uh, sort of are impinging on the surface. Now, what happens if you are in a solenoid? It's actually that the solenoidal field, the longitudinal field, helps to sort of maintains these electrons on their on the straight path, but they spiral around the magnetic field. So, so all of the electrons emitted here hit the surface in one spot on the other side and start heating that. And all the electrons produced here, they go straight back and hit this spot. So, so here you get a breakdown very easily because uh, this is very localized. What you see here, the heat load is distributed over a large part. And that's why in a solenoid, uh, you have a problem with an RF cavity. But there are two solutions and they have been tried and uh, found to be effective. One is, since the heating of the surface is a problem from the electrons, you use shorter pulses, less energy, that uh, helps. And the other one is you replace the copper with beryllium, which has a lower Z and uh, is less dense. And therefore, you have less uh, local deposition of energy by the electrons. And that also worked. And so, so that actually gave us great insight in, in the cool, uh, that, that are 50 megavolts per meter or so, and that are uh, high enough. Now, that would need to be studied in a higher field. The other trick is you fill your cavity with gas, hydrogen gas, at high pressure. And what happens now is that the free electron, when it starts moving, it will hit hydrogen atoms and transmit some of its energy and momentum to these atoms. And, and then it will uh, stay there and will be re-accelerated because the field is still there. Now, what you have to make sure is that if the mean free path the electron has before it hits hydrogen, uh, hydrogen atom 
on average, should be small enough that the energy gain of the electron is not sufficient to ionize the hydrogen. So there is a very clear cut. If your energy gain, if your electron gains less energy than it needs to ionize um, the hydrogen, then indeed uh, the cavity should have an avalanche effect. You see that here, the density of the gas, the gradient that you can obtain, it goes up linearly. And then at some point it levels. And that is because now you start having problems from the surface. And then that depends on the surface material, on the cavity material. So molybdenum, for example, works very nicely and it gives you gradients of 65 megawatts per meter, which is plenty of sufficient. But you need 100 bar uh, roughly of hydrogen inside. So that also has been cool. The concept of the cooling as a whole has been uh, tested in uh, the UK in mice, uh, which was a little more uh, challenging in its own sort of getting things together. Um, and what you see here is uh, the, the experiment where you have muons coming from the lab. Uh, they go through a solenoid. You have a place in the middle where you can actually put an absorber. And then you measure the muon after it was measured before. And now if you look at um, uh, the, the measurement when you don't have the absorber in place, then you have this brownish distribution of muons with their amplitude, so horizontal amplitude, and the number going in here, and you have the green uh, muons that make it. So, so some get lost because they are at large amplitudes. Now you put in the absorber, and what happens is you have the same distribution before, as expected, but after the absorber, you now have actually more muons at low amplitudes, and uh, you still have a few at high amplitudes. So what has happened is that some of the muons that have uh, large amplitudes actually reduce the amplitude um, because of the absorber. So they are cooled, and that's why they populate this here more. So, so you see the shrinking of the phase space. Uh, that's the cooling. So that has nicely worked. Okay, after the cooling, let's look into the acceleration. And the acceleration is a system, as I said, of a LINAC to have high field initially to, to rapidly go to a larger gamma, recirculating LINAX as a compromise, and then a system of rings, which is probably like three for the 10 TV. Um, that still has to be optimized, but then, so the initial promise are three. And these rings are challenging because you need to uh, rapidly increase the energy uh, by a factor of a few in the ring. And so what you would do is you would pulse the magnets in the ring to follow the beam energy. Uh, it's like in a recycling, uh, a rapid cycling synchrotron. In this case, it's pulsed because it's not, uh, not harmonic. Or you can use an alternative uh, static uh, superconducting field solution, but that's also very, very, very challenging. Now, the challenge in these rapid cycling synchrotrons or a, a pulse synchrotron is the following. Um, well, the design is actually a mixture of warm and cold magnets to save space. So what you do is you have the cold magnets and they bend the beam to the proper location. So, so the, the um, center of the ring is on the inside. Uh, this should be slightly bent. And um, initially you have the warm, fast ramping magnets uh, pushing the particles to the outside. So, so you see the low energy particles, they stay on track because they are over focus over bend here in the, and then uh, they are bent backward to the outside in the warm dipoles and then bent back here. And then as you increase the energy at some point you are matched. So you reduce the field in the normal magnets. And if it's zero, then the particle goes through straight. It's at half energy. And then at uh, higher energy, uh, you ramp up the um, warm magnets. And so they add to the bending by the cold magnets. And so, so you keep the, the high energy also focused around. And it's just showing that. This is the type of magnet that you've designed for that. Now, what is the challenge in this? And actually, in this case, the magnets are difficult. But the challenge for once is with the power converter experts. So they really like this as a project. Because now you look at the energy that is stored in these magnets, and it's 300 megajoule. That's still OK. They have, there are um, power converters, uh, sets of power converters that make that store like 100 megajoule here for a laser. Um, you need a peak power of something like 200 gigawatts. So that's the power flowing into the magnets uh, during the pulse. And that still uh, exists. But you want to do that very often. You see here, this laser thing actually fires every 25 minutes. And we want to have our system fire five times a second. So, so that's a big challenge. 
<laughs> difference. And the average power is actually about three gigawatts because it's like uh, you, you put in the energy before the beam comes, you take it out and put it back with the other sign while the beam is there. So that's two times putting in the energy and that you do five times a second. So, so you, you put in the 300 megajoule, uh, roughly 10 times a second. So that's three gigawatts flowing into the magnets. And now obviously you cannot afford to lose this energy. You have to recover it with a very high efficiency each cycle, something like 98%. So the efficiency, keeping the energy uh, without losses on its way to uh, going into the magnets and being recovered, that is a big challenge. Here we see, by the way, a CERN system, uh, but that's only at 20 megajoules, so significantly less. And this is the design that we have of the uh, new power converters that we need. And so people are actively designing them. Then we can look at the collider ring. What's the challenge there? Well, the muons decay all the time. So all of the muons that you inject into the collider ring basically will decay. And one third of their energy roughly will be an electron or positron on average, and they will be lost. So that means you have 500 watts of particles impinging on the inner surface of the magnets around the ring. You have to protect your uh, magnets from that by putting in some shielding. And something like 30 millimeter tungsten or so uh, seems to be OK. Uh, the radiation in the magnets, I mean, the heat load in the magnets would be OK. And the radiation that goes to the magnets in terms of neutrons is an order of magnitude uh, below what uh, is acceptable. So it's fine. And it would be uh, roughly so sort of on the limit of the radiation hardness of the raisin. So that also is OK. And it could always be improved a little bit by making it. Uh, by making it a bit uh, thicker. The problem is that you have to put the shielding. So the magnet becomes relatively large in aperture because the magnet has to go around the shielding. And then you're not limited by the conductor, the, the field that it can hold, but by the stress that the whole magnet as such has if you power it. And that works for the 3 TV because we want only 11 Tesla. But if you want to push um, to higher fields, say at the 10 TV collider, we might like 16 Tesla, then you have to design your magnets such that they are experience less stress. And you have uh, an idea which is uh, stress management uh, dipoles being developed at Fermilab, where basically these conventional four layer magnets, uh, you, you take the outer layers and you split them into smaller windings. And by that, you actually take stress off these uh, superconductors and can go to higher fields with large aperture. So as we hope works. The same at the, the IP, the focusing. Uh, at 3 TV, we have uh, focusing magnets in the design that correspond roughly to what is being done for Hilumi LHC. And by that time, all the problems should be sorted out. So we still have a few years. While if you go to 10 TV, you need uh, higher fields. So instead of 12 Tesla in the aperture, you need to go to 20. And you need a somewhat increased aperture also. Um, here is here design that we, we have and this here is um, like the uh, the field and the, the aperture you need. Uh, the aperture here is in black, half aperture in that case. Um, so for that we need HTS, but that would come in the second stage and it's a few magnets so the, the, the cost is not the problem, it's really just uh, pushing the technology far enough. And then let's go to the uh, most critical problem in a way, which is the neutrino flux. So when your muons decay, they produce an electron or positron, but also two neutrinos, a muon and an electron neutrino or anti-muon, uh, as you might expect. And now um, these neutrinos go happily through the Earth. Um, they have a very small uh, cross-section. And then they come out in a very narrow region on the surface. And even if the cross-section is very small, the cross-section is not zero. So they can lead to some increase of uh, radiation on the surface. We talk about something that is well below uh, the natural level, but the goal is certainly of our project is to have a negligible impact. So something that is considered fully optimized, like the LHC, has a negligible impact on the environment and not just a small one. And in order to achieve that, the 3 TV collider just needs to be put deep enough down and probably 200 meters sufficient. And then for high energies, the idea is to actually then uh, move this cone vertically up and down. So you see the scheme here. You, you would have a vertical um, structure in your beam line. 
like this, and uh, and this one spot, the, the neutrinos would go straight. And then sometime later, you, you have removed this pattern. And so uh, the beam is pointing upwards at this location and your neutrinos go in this direction. And if you choose a range of plus minus one milliradian for this angle, then actually you reduce the radiation at the neutrino flux by more than two orders of magnitude and you are perfectly in the negligible regime even with a 14 TV collider. So that's the idea. Certainly this is a challenging system that needs to be worked out, the mechanics of that and to make sure that this does not impact the beam operation but it is a principal solution that um, can allow us to go to high energy. Um, there is a serious investigation of the uh, neutrino effect mitigation in uh, collaboration with um, uh, radiation protection, civil engineers, beam physicists, and FUCA experts. So you see this is their sketch of the situation. And the way this is done by choosing the site so that individual uh, high um, uh, flex spots would be uh, part of the uh, part of the, the fenced um, site and uh, this mechanical system and uh, you see there so there's an exploration of the the site uh, simulations of the the actual effects and then assessments of how this could be secured so so that one can ensure that there's absolutely no uh, impact and uh, not rely just on calculations on but being able to, to verify and practice that indeed nothing has gone wrong. Okay, the other problem, but I will not say much, uh, I think there will be more in the next talk is the machine uh, detector interface. Uh, but there are many background sources. Again, uh, these electrons and positrons from the muon decay being the most important, several 10,000 per uh, meter and bunch crossing. And then there's some beam beam background, which actually is important, even if it's uh, less than the other one. And uh, so, so those particles, when they are lost, produce showers that can propagate into the detector. And you put a set of masks to actually stop most of them getting into your detector. You still get some background here, but um, you hope that, um, I mean, you, you can use timing cuts and the directional cuts in order to get rid of most of that. And so there is a very active study um, driven by NFN and uh, University of Padua. Uh, you, probably aware of uh, Donatella leading that, which is actively working on that and showed that actually at a, a one and a half TV and now a three TV, that the results are encouraging and the effects should be uh, reasonable. And the studies at 10 TV started. Okay, so we feel that the MDI is one of the main challenges that can be addressed, but there is more support always welcome also from the reconstruction side, from the detectors. And from the theorist side, so, so we have a Delphi's card, a Delphi's card that describes the detector and that you can use for your theoretical studies to verify how that works um, from a realistic detector. Um, we consider to build a demonstrator after the next European strategy because it will cost a few hundred million. And that will test the muon cooling and the production. So it would consist of um, a target with a horn initially and then later with a superconducting solenoid. It's mainly because the solenoid is not cheap. And then a momentum selection and a chicane to select your muons. And then you would go into a cooling area after some diagnostics to cool the, the muons and measure them after. So that's the, the basic uh, principle. And we looked into the option to cite this at CERN. We would also see if it can be done elsewhere. And there is a part, uh, some land close to CERN that belongs to CERN. If you know CERN, this is, CERN is down here. This is the Route de Marin. This here is where the, is the golf course. You can see that. But this here belongs to CERN. And so we are going to, um, so, so we, we could put the test facility there. And actually, there is also a transfer line that brings proton beam from the EPS to the SPS, which could be used to inject into the test facility. So, and that would be a really good test beam. And if the SPL were to be built at any time, that actually could feed into the same place. So, so this here is a civil engineering first sketch of how that could look like. And there is enough space here on this side that you could imagine having a neutrino facility using the same infrastructure. So the target and after the target, you would switch into maybe something like New Storm if you had the additional funds so that we can do. And then very quickly, you get much more detail in the European X-rate R&D roadmap, which has been developed last year 
by the laboratory directors group with the help of some expert panels and which has been reviewed by SPC and then agreed. I don't know exactly what the formality uh, wording was by council in December and council charged actually uh, the LDG to develop an implementation plan which they should present this month. And uh, there are all the work packages, including resource estimates for this program. So you see that here on the right, with an inspiration program that achieves everything we want at a minimal achieves something. And uh, you can find the report here uh, if you are interested. The timeline, it's a little uncertain, like always, because we don't know what the strategic considerations are. So we have an aspirational timeline, which is technically limited, where we would, uh, until the next European strategy by the end of 25, uh, have a baseline design and a design of the demonstrator if you get the aspirational program or scenario funding scenario and then there would be European strategy thinking about that and um, then one could start with the demonstrator construction so we assume it will take one year to ramp up after the European strategy uh, to have a demonstrator and then in uh, 33 one would be ready with results from the demonstrator uh, so that one can decide to go into a technical design. And we would still exploit the demonstrator uh, for, for the tests. And after technical design, one could start construction to be ready by the mid of 2040s, which is quite ambitious. But it means it could be the next project after high luminosity LHC, if Europe felt that this was needed. And then just before I stop, uh, there are some ongoing activities. I, I talked about the problems because this is what we work on, we, we are focusing on the challenges and uh, we feel that they can be overcome, but uh, still the challenges are important. Um, and that's what motivates accelerator physicists to uh, tackle that. Um, so, so what we have as ongoing activities was to identify them and to, to make the work plan. There is work ongoing on the radiation protection, on the MDI, on the collidering, very much on the cooling system, uh, right before the laboratory started do things on the target, uh, you saw some results. The RF team came up with a number of uh, suggestions. But the power converters you also saw uh, and the demonstrator site. And then the small contributions like students doing work, doing calculations or experts, uh, which are very valuable, but it's not yet the full-fledged effort. And there's interested, uh, interest now to do more work and we prepare an EU design study to be submitted next month. Um, to work on the pulse synchrotrons, the Linux proton complex and alternatives. And there are interested partners. So, so this is not committed yet, but there's active uh, follow up and the, the, they mostly participate to actually preparing the EU design studies. So, so that's right. uh, the target magnets, uh, the different ones, and the RF, you see that here. And you see actually, for example, INFN is appearing in a number of places or Italian universities also. Um, okay, and so, so there are people getting ready to start the journey while others are already on the journey. I would like to thank all the people that helped with the roadmap. So there's the uh, Muon Beam panel. And we had a number of community meetings with plenty of conveners from all over the world, including the US and Asia, uh, also at the large level and many participants uh, that uh, contributed. So, so thanks to them. And then I wanted to say one word about uh, LEMA because that has been developed in, uh, at INFN mostly. It is a very interesting alternative um, where you, you replace your proton source by a uh, positron source. So, so, um, so, so you have a positron Linux, you shoot into a target at 45 GV. And then you are above the muon production threshold if you collide with an electron. And so what you then do is you, you um, uh, collect the, the produce muons in a collector ring and send a bunch a number of times through the target. And each time you have a new positron bunch, so you produce more muons. And so, so you can collect them here. But you get a little emittance growth in the muons also. So that limits how often you can do that. And by that, you uh, generate a small emittance muon beam, which you then use and you accelerate as before and collide. So this is a great concept and it can indeed give you small emittances. The main challenge that this is facing is that the cost of producing, the energy cost of producing one muon pair is very high because for each electron, uh, for each positron that produces a muon, you have a hundred thousand that 
emit uh, brandstrahlung and get lost. And um, it is very difficult to get a density of uh, positrons in here that is sufficient to make the, the muon beam dense enough to give you the luminosity we want at the IP. So, so uh, it seems that we need a great new idea to make this scheme actually work. So, so it's something we should keep in mind, but we, we, there is not a clear path now how to make that, how to overcome the, the obstacles. But the proton complex, on the other hand, we have a plan of, we, we think that all of the, the, the problems can be overcome. We have a plan of how to overcome them. Here it needs some young or maybe old uh, person to have a, a clever idea and then maybe that uh, can be used. So in conclusion, the Mion Collider, uh, it's a unique opportunity for high energy, high luminosity lepton collider with a luminosity to beam power ratio that's specifically good and improves and the cost efficiency to be verified, but we expect it to be very good. Um, we look at three and 10 TV and while it's not as mature as I see or click and there are important R&D items, we did not see any showstopper in, in this process last year. It was all yeah, difficult, but it can be overcome with technologies and technologies look promising enough that in a decade or so, so that can be there. And now we will make it prepared for the next European strategy. Hopefully that uh, they can make an informed decision. And then there is a website that you can uh, have a look to, to get more information. So thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela. <clears throat> yeah, very interesting talk. Um, so I think uh, maybe we can have, uh, if there are one or two quick questions, and then we leave the back of the discussion after the two talks. Um, so if there are any questions, people can raise the hand. Um, there is, uh, in the meanwhile, there is one, uh, there was one question from the beginning uh, from, in the chat from uh, Juan Maldacina. Yeah, uh, I can read it or. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I cannot see the chat, but yeah, that, that was answered. Thank you, thank you. That was it answered. Was, ah. It was answered during the talk. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. Otherwise, you put your questions after the the next presentation. Yes. Think. Okay. So let us move to the second talk, and then then we have the discussion after. Yeah. Yeah. Kendra. Okay. So our uh, next speaker is uh, Liantao Wang. Liantao is a. Uh, He's professor at the University of Chicago. He got his PhD from Michigan, and then he was postdoc in Wisconsin and Harvard. And before moving to Chicago, he was also a professor in Princeton. He has been working a lot recently on the physics case uh, for a future collider, especially lepton colliders. So I think uh, it's uh, the appropriate name uh, to, to discuss uh, what, what, what could be the phys physics imp implications of uh, of such a wonderful machine uh, as a Mion Collider. Please, Leon, tell. Okay, all right. So um, thanks for the invitation. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think Daniel has a, a great cover job for all the uh, machine options. So I, I'll talk about, the, I'll continue to talk about the, the physics case for, for Mion Colliders. Um, <clears throat> so let me begin with the, the obvious. That uh, you know, I think uh, you know th these are some of the ben benchmarks that uh, that Daniel already mentioned, and uh, and uh, I think the obvious thing is that, that this is the energy frontier, and uh, we're probing shorter distances. And uh, I think is that good enough motivation for us? I think uh, I hope it's a, it's a, it's a yes for most of us. And uh, still, I think uh, the answer, uh, I, I think we would like to know the, the answer is that, uh, yes, we wanted to go to higher energies, but uh, you know, what uh, in particular this kind of uh, high energy can bring us? Uh, why do we want to have a, a muon collider at these kind of energies? And uh, for that, let's, uh, let's uh, come back a little bit to, to, to what, uh, you know, look at what we have uh, you know, installed uh, in, the, in the near term future. And uh, so, so of course, LHC, uh, High Lumi LHC is going to uh, keep uh, collecting uh, a lot of data. And uh, I think uh, also there have been, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> low energy, e in particular, low energy uh, E plus E minus uh, X factories being proposed and also Z factories and so on that, that uh, uh, yeah, these things. The, 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 the focus of these, uh, uh, this set of machines options are, I would say, uh, getting more precision and going after rare processes. 
And uh, when I think about the, the physics case for, for muon collider, I would like to think about the muon collider should be the one that going beyond these options, not just beyond the high Lumi RGC, but also uh, beyond the, the, the low energy Higgs factories. And uh, I think this will come up uh, in, in various contexts later in the talk, but let me just say it uh, you know, uh, here as an as overall statement. That there are also another, I think, a machine sort of a little bit further down the road on the, being proposed on the horizon are uh, these uh, 100 TeV-ish uh, TeV PP colliders, and, uh, such as FCCHH and uh, uh, SPPC. And, uh, and uh, these are you know, uh, powerful proton colliders. Of course, when you collide protons, you don't, you don't collide, uh, you know, only, only what's useful is the proton center of mass energy. And uh, these are the, the comparisons. I think I already see a plot of this uh, to this effect in Daniel's talk. And these are somewhat more detailed figures, depends on, slightly depends on the assumptions that uh, you make about the, the production cross sections. But very roughly speaking, a 100 TeV PP collider will be equivalent to a, a 10 TeV-ish muon collider. So I would say very broadly speaking, these two uh, options are comparable. At the same time, of course, a lepton collider, muon collider as a lepton collider is cleaner. And uh, so it's in general, it will be good for, for, for precision and uh, also for look for difficult uh, uh, search channels. Okay, so uh, the physics program at the Muon Collider has been uh, considered quite actively recently. And uh, I would say very broadly, it, it can be break down into uh, two categories. The first is the Higgs properties. The, the second is a, a new physics at higher energies. And then there are probably other things don't quite be, can be covered by these two categories, but I'll, I'll focus on these two main physics uh, categories. So Higgs properties, again, I will start with the, the obvious. I think, um, I hope we all agree, it's very important to, to understand the, the Higgs properties. It's, uh, it's closely connected to so many important questions we wanted to answer, such as the origin of the weak scale and the nature of the, 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 the electroweak symmetry breaking and the phase transition. And uh, Higgs can also serve as a portal to, to a dark sector. So all these things we are hope to uh, answer by measuring uh, the, the Higgs better and uh, look for the properties better. <clears throat> and uh, I think what's not so obvious is that uh, what does muon collider running at high energies bring to the table in this endeavor? So let's uh, have a closer look at, uh, at it, focusing on muon colliders. So this is a, this is a figure that uh, Chen Liu and I are in, uh, working on uh, as an input for the snow mass study. And uh, this shows you the, 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 the capability um, of muon collider as a Higgs factory. And this is the Higgs productions. And, uh, and, uh, and the, these are the few benchmarks that uh, Daniel mentioned as a, the, the currently under consideration for muon colliders for various energy and the luminosities. I also take the liberty to imagine that maybe one day we can, we can go to 30 T. Okay, so, so, so these are the, the luminosity needed. This is the luminosity. The lower solid curve is the luminosity needed to produce a million Higgs and, uh, and uh, in, in 10 snow mass years. And, uh, and uh, this is the <clears throat> luminosity needed to produce uh, uh, 10 million Higgs. So in comparison, just, just uh, uh, in comparison and the, some of the lower energy uh, Higgs factories, they are all broadly aiming at a million Higgs bosons. And uh, another way of looking at this is to, to look at another set of benchmarks, assuming some uh, simple luminosity scaling relation, which is not quite uh, this line, but uh, close. And uh, so, so what's not on this is that uh, there is also a, another option for running muon collider at the 125 GeV, at the, uh, sitting on the Higgs pole. It can also produce uh, 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 Higgs, depends on the luminosity scenarios. And uh, then uh, there, there are some of the high energy uh, benchmarks. Just based on this, uh, this kind of comparison, I think uh, you know, in order to compare with the low energy uh, Higgs factories, you, know, you, you, you sort of expect that uh, uh, starting from CVTV and above, 
the muon collider should perform better than the low energy Higgs factories. Okay, so, so we can look at the, some of the more detailed studies. So this is I'm taking from a, a paper that's coming out prepared by these authors. And, uh, and this is a, a, a fit, uh, the projection of the precision can be reached effective coupling. Uh, can be reached at the various uh, colliders. So the, the in particular, the, the, the muon collider running on the Higgs pole is this uh, light blue bars. You know, you, you see that uh, it's it's not that surprising because it doesn't produce enough uh, as many Higgs. It's not too surprising that uh, if we only that's the only thing we have, it's less competitive <clears throat> in comparison with uh, with with the with what the, a uh, low energy Higgs factor such as FEE, FCCE can achieve. Um, <clears throat> and of course, uh, muon, we should keep in mind that the muon collider is, a, is a especially strong in measuring the muon couplings. So this is a, also shown in this, uh, in this side here. And uh, now, once you can start to combine it with some uh, higher energies, um, uh, you know, the runs of muon colliders, it, it already starts to help, okay? And uh, um, <clears throat> this is, this you, you, you actually see this from the difference between this uh, uh, light gray bar versus the more uh, dense colored bars with, with 3 TV and so on. So, so these are, whether you are including the 3 TV run or not, okay? So this is, a, you, you, as, if, as expected, again, you know, once you, you going for higher energy, you produce more hexes. Also new physics effect is more obvious at higher energies. So th this will help. And uh, if for even higher energies, so, so I'm just uh, taking a, a, an estimate that uh, was done uh, last year, that uh, you know, uh, a simple estimate. And so some of these numbers obviously has to be backed up by uh, more detailed studies. At the same time, this does show that uh, you know, there is a potential to reach a, a very good precision, like a, you know, per mule precision or better, even better, is possible at running at uh, you know, 10 plus T energies at, uh, at a muon collider. In comparison with, again, the, the running for uh, only at the, <clears throat> only at a 125 GeV muon collider, which you achieve a percentage-ish uh, precisions. Another great advantage of running at uh, uh, higher energies is that you start to have a, a significant statistics on, on double Higgs productions. So this is again shows on the left hand side plot here. So this this green curve is is where you where are you going to have a, a, a hundred thousand double Higgs event, and you see that uh, some of the, the high energy options, you know, really uh, can that this is what the, some of the, the high energy options can deliver. So this is uh, great for, for, again, measure uh, a set of Higgs couplings. So and also, uh, again, remember that the new physics effect also becomes larger at higher energies. So it has a really great, good potential. So I will just uh, briefly, and this is the basic argument. I will just briefly show you a few of the, the available studies. And uh, so, so I think one of the focus of this is, uh, is try to understand the nature of electric phase transition whether it's a uh, just a rolling uh, like this uh, as, a, as a standard model production prediction, or whether it's a first order phase transition. Okay, a main difference between these two picture is that the shape of the Higgs potential uh, is different, and the, one place it will show up is the Higgs self coupling measurement. So, for example, if you look, this is a uh, this is just a <clears throat> a, a parameter stand for a, a simple singlet model that uh, you know, these dots has a, has a first order phase transition. So they, they are corresponding the, to, the, to the right-hand side figure here. You see that the, 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 the horizontal axis is the self Higgs self coupling measurement. So uh, measure the Higgs self coupling, self -coupling better. That is you know, basically you're squeezing the parameter space in these directions and it, 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 it definitely helps to, to constrain a lot of these models. So, which is not a, not a surprising. A lot of the models with the first order phase transition 
will have a big uh, modification for the Higgs potential and a big deviation on the on the triple Higgs uh, <clears throat> couple. Okay, so here are some of the, the studies for, 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 for muon colliders. So uh, based on uh, slightly somewhat different uh, uh, parameterizations of where the uh, modification of the Higgs self-coupling can come from. Uh, for example, can come from a operator like this, which actually its effect grows, <clears throat> grows with energy. And uh, also, uh, and, uh, this, so this is a study uh, looking at a somewhat different channel. I think the basic, I, I'm not going to be able to go through uh, too much of the detail of these studies. And the, the basic uh, uh, um, uh, message is that the, the precision should be better than the click and FCCHH if we can run at the central mass uh, energy uh, around the 10 TeV. Okay, so, so you can see you know, this is the, this is, I think this is the, the 10 TeV mark for muon collider. And then you see that, and here, here is the precision you can achieve for, for click. Okay, so these blue contours are, are precisions you can achieve uh, measuring this operator, for example. And uh, one can even go further because the standard, uh, standard model also has a, has a uh, pre specific prediction for the Higgs quarter coupling. For a direct probing of the quarter coupling, you can if you want to look at a triple Higgs. Uh, final state, and of course, uh, in in reality, the we look for triple Higgs final state. Also, the the, the self coupling, uh, uh, triple Higgs coupling enters in, in addition to the quartic uh, coupling. Okay, so so here is a in the end, you 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 are going to get a combined constraint and a contour. So 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 I'm just taking the slide the slides from a, <clears throat> a, a recent conference. And, uh, and, uh, and the, the basic conclusion here is that, uh, again, a 10 TeV muon collider can do better than, uh, than, uh, than the FCC in this channel as well. Okay, another question we always wanted to know is, is, is Higgs the only scalar around, you know, or does it have something similar uh, to it? And, uh, even, you know, and it's easier to write uh, a theory that, that where scalar actually mix with each other and so on. Uh, a standard testing case is a, is a, is a Higgs mixed with a, with a singlet scalar, which I already show you a little bit in associated with the, 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 the phase transition model, but uh, this can be studied in a more general sense. And, uh, and the, both because it's easy to write a model like this, uh, also because uh, it's, uh, it's also actually a quite difficult model to, to to, to, to search. So it's a good testing case for the caliber of, uh, of, of high energy colliders. So, so this is the, uh, this, this is a mixing angle uh, of uh, the sine gamma is, is the mixing angle between the singlet and the, the, the Higgs. And the, the horizontal axis is the, is the, <clears throat> is the scalar mass. And, uh, and you see that uh, in this case, and the, and the High Lumi RTC uh, barely touches this uh, this parameter space. Even 100 TeV PP collider with some uh, pretty <clears throat> big luminosity um, can only co cover part of it. At the same time, <clears throat> and starting from a uh, central mass energy around 6 TeV muon collider, is start to really making uh, big headways into probing this kind of parameter space. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, uh, another question that uh, associated with the, 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 you know, the, the Higgs uh, properties is the origin of weak scale. I think this is a very familiar question and, uh, and uh, I, I won't spend too much words on it. And basically um, this, this is called a naturalness problem or hierarchy problem. And, uh, and the, 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 the usual way of, of dealing with this is to introduce high new physics, uh, not too far away from the weak scale and uh, which I call it the usual naturalness. And uh, it's not discovered at our LGC, but could it just be a little bit delayed? I think it's still a pretty plausible uh, option and it's certainly worthwhile to, uh, to probe it much further with, at, 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 at the higher energy uh, colliders. Here again, it's, the, it's uh, running at the higher energy 
muon collider uh, really shines. So, so these, uh, you know, we're, we're imagining some, uh, you know, one of the, the standard particle that associated with the uh, naturalness of weak scale is a, is a tau partner. Okay, so uh, we either have a scalar tau partner or can have a fermionic tau partner, depends on models. And uh, we imagine there's some kind of a pair production and, uh, and these tau partners will then decay and the, the signal will be actually quite spectacular. And, uh, and, and because muon collider is a relatively clean machine, we do expect that the, the dis uh, discovery is possible just with tens of events. So, so these are, for example, these curves are the uh, needed luminosity to, uh, oh, sorry, because it's a pair production, you, you, we, we expect that the, the maximal reach will be half of the center of mass energy of the collider, okay? But because it, you do have background, you have to make some kind of cuts and their acceptance, you know, maybe a reasonable goal is somewhat less than uh, maybe, um, you know, 45% of the center of mass. So, so these are the uh, luminosity that's needed to reach this, uh, this ultimate goal, to search for tau partners. You see that the, the, all the current benchmarks are way above uh, this kind of target just because of this, uh, this kind of signal is really uh, easy to look for. And, uh, and uh, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, <clears throat> again, and some uh, um, preliminary uh, estimates uh, presented in the Muon Smasher's Guide. This is the, uh, this is the, uh, the, the case uh, the example of uh, SUSY stops, both left-handed and right-handed. You see that, yes, we do expect that, the, uh, as we expected, Roughly speaking, the, the reach is quite close to the to the <clears throat> to the to the half of the center of mass energy. Of course, the direct pr production is not the only way we can use to probe these kind of models. That one can also try to uh, uh, probing uh, these kind of models by by making measurements on the on the on the uh, <clears throat> EFT operators and. Uh, and, uh, and because again, the, we are running at higher energies and, uh, and the, the, the energy, uh, the, the effect of new physics tends to grow at higher energies, you do expect a very big enhancement uh, in terms of reach by, by doing that. So this is the, the, the case of the composite Higgs model, which is uh, you know, at least uh, in the simplified version, you can, it can be char characterized by two parameters. One is the, 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 the coupling, composite, uh, Composite coupling and the and the and the the mass scale of the of the composite resonances. So you see that uh, uh, you know running at the different energies, which is the number in the bracket here. You know um, and the muon collider can uh, you know at running at high energies can really make a huge headways beyond the, the, the current constraint and and the, and the constraint in the in in any foreseeable future. So um, Higgs can also serve as a portal to the dark uh, sector. So this is basically uh, you know you, you have a stand uh, you have a setup like this and uh, and uh, and the, the coupling between the standard model and the dark sector is parameterized by a standard model operator times a dark sector operator, and uh, the Higgs boson because it's a uh, it's a it's a spin zero has this. Uh, Lowest dimensional uh, gauge invariant standard model operator you can write down. So this gives you perhaps the the, 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 the the most relevant coupling between the standard model and the and the and the, and the, and the dark sector. One way to look for these things is to look for a uh, uh, Higgs uh, rare decays. So you will produce the Higgs and the Higgs decay into dark sector and the dark sector in turn decay back into standard model. Uh, particles to be to, to be to be observed okay so this is a, so there are many many uh, uh, possibilities and uh, we see that uh, you know uh, in, in lepton colliders uh, in particular for those channels that has a larger background at hadron colliders and the, the lepton collider can have great reach uh, for for these channels such a, such as only have missing energy or with jets plus missing energy and so on. So these channels are very difficult at the hydron collider, even though hydron collider do tends to produce more Higgs bosons. Okay, so this is a study done by the, uh, for the low energy uh, Higgs factories with, with again, a million Higgses. 
But as I said earlier, so for high energy muon colliders, we expect to have uh, you know, uh, more Higgs bosons being produced. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so, so we, I definitely expect that this, this the study still has to be done, but the, the high energy muon collider will certainly do better. That's my expectation. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about the Higgs. Now let's I'll move on to say something about other new physics at high energy scales. There are many, many candidates. So uh, here's a, only a very partial list. Even from uh, you know from this list, I won't be able to cover all of them. So let me just uh, you know. But you know, wimp dark matter is a has frequently been mentioned as a main physics driver for for future colliders. So let me spend some time uh, focusing on the, on the, on this case. So again, this is a familiar story. So the WIMP is a peeling framework because it's just based on a very simple assumption that the dark matter is in thermal equilibrium with the standard model in the early universe. Okay, so, um, and, and everything else just follows from that. Um, of course, uh, this still uh, depends on the actual erratic abundance, still depends on the, the uh, um, the, the coupling and the, the, the mass of the dark matter. So there are many models of WIMPs being, being explored. But in, in, in terms of thinking about uh, uh, high energy uh, colliders in the future, I think a, a main uh, uh, argument is that uh, and, uh, finally at, at, at those uh, energies where we are have the opportunity to actually probe the, the simplest model, which is the uh, dark matter is a part of an electroweak multiplet. Okay, so, so and, uh, and uh, this is simple because uh, there's no additional new uh, interactions needs to be assumed that uh, between the dark, sec dark matter uh, multiplet and, the, and the, the standard model, they are mediated by, by the standard model weak, in, weak interactions. And uh, yeah, so these, these model tends to be very, very predictive. So, so there are two familiar examples uh, in SUSY, for example, uh, either is the Higgsino, which is an electric doublet, or WINO, which is a uh, uh, WINO dark matter, which is a, in an electric triplet. Okay, so let me go into some of the, some more details talking about this kind of models. So, so you can you can think of a dark matter is in the electric multiplet. It's an amplet with a, with a hypercharge Y. And uh, we can consider, obviously, first the fermionic uh, multiplet. This is probably the most predictive model. The only uh, couplings at the renormalizable level are, are gauge interactions. Hence, the only free parameter at this model is the mass of the dark matter. Okay, it's very predictive. And uh, the details depends on whether the, the dimension of the multiplet is even or odd. Okay, so first of all, we probably won't shouldn't consider too much about the, 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 the multiplets with very large dimensions. In that case, the Landau pole is actually quite close to the scale, mass scale of the dark matter. And uh, at the same time, you know, uh, the, the, the multiplet is not fully degenerate because the electroweak symmetry breaking will generate uh, a, a mass splitting, at least at one loop level. Okay. And uh, in this case, there is a natural dark matter candidate, which uh, <clears throat> if we choose the y equals zero, the, the lightest member is electric uh, neutral and so on. And uh, for even case, it's slightly more complicated. So you, you do have to make a specific choice for, uh, uh, for the lightest member is neutral. And uh, also if you take the model as it is, uh, there is a uh, large direct detection cross-section uh, through a tree-level C exchange. This could be uh, alleviated by introducing a very small coupling, you know, perhaps coming from a dimension five operator and so on. Okay, it's the, at, the, at the same time, it, it's easier to do this. It does also mean that uh, the model is not quite uh, uh, minimal. In particular, this means that this, uh, this kind of mass splitting is, is, is somewhat more model dependent. Than the, than the case of uh, than the previous case. Again, the famous example here is a Higgs signal. And one could also, in principle, consider both real and the complex data uh, as a, as a, in these representations. And the the, the minimal for, for the minimal case, 
if we make some minimality assumptions, the mass splitting stability discussion is quite similar to the, to the fermionic multiplet. At the same time, for scalars, we do have a, at a renormalizable level, uh, couplings like that, which can uh, uh, you know, in, introduce more uh, deformation of the mass spectrum and, uh, and, and more complicated um, uh, <clears throat> analysis is needed. So, for, so, so far, I think the most of the study has been focused on the fermionic case. Okay, as I, as I mentioned, these models, the one of the, the, the main uh, char characterization of these models is that it has a thermal target. It, 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 it's very predictive, especially these fermion models, that uh, you, you actually have, uh, it predicts, uh, points you to a specific mass where, where you actually get the correct relic abundance. And uh, you know these are the, the, the thermal targets. And, uh, and the first of all, you notice all these are in, at least in the multiple TV range, okay? So th this is the, the reason why we have not been able to really uh, probe any of this model directly at the colliders yet, okay? So this is the, um, we just don't have enough energy to go, go after the, these kind of, so, such a heavy waves. That, that's why the next generation you know, uh, colliders at higher energies is so exciting. Uh, too. Okay, so first of all, one can, you know, uh, instead of going after them, uh, just directly produce at the colliders, one can also go after them as they're, they, uh, they have virtual effect that can modify the, 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 the fermion, fermion to fermion, fermion amplitude, which can be uh, probed at, uh, at the colliders and that they do uh, probe uh, although, quote, indirect, this does probe uh, uh, quite a bit of the, <clears throat> of the parameter space of this model at, at the 14 TeV VR collider. And uh, for direct signals, uh, there are two kinds. Again, uh, the, we can try to produce the dark matter, direct production of the dark matter particle and, uh, and, uh, and in associated with something else. This is called a, typically called a, a, a mono X. It's actually quite uh, inclusive. So this is, for example, a standard example of this is mono jet search at colliders. Okay, of course, at the lepton colliders, it would be mono something else, okay, but the, the general features are similar. At the same time, if we do have those uh, small electroweak induced mass splittings, the charge members of the, the electric multiplet will become long-lived, this leads to another set of uh, interesting signal about disappearing tracks. Okay, so again, I don't have time to, probably won't have time to go into many of the, these details. Uh, this has been uh, quite a, a folk intensive uh, studies recently with, uh, with the increasing level of, of realism. And uh, so, so model X, again, I think it's, uh, it's more generic, more model independent. And uh, uh, it's somewhat more in independent uh, of the spectrum, and uh, and uh, there are you know also interesting channels being uh, discovered along the way, such as mono muon and the mono W channel. Okay, so this is uh, and uh, and the disappearing tracks uh, uh, search is actually uh, more powerful if we do have a uh, because it's very unique signal. Again, I wanted to emphasize again there's some model dependence you know, on on the mass splitting. And it's also quite sensitive to the to the beam induced background that, uh, that Daniel uh, mentioned earlier, and uh, it's important to have this uh, this this estimates correct. Okay, so these are the reaches, and uh, um, <clears throat> we see that. So here here is the reach for hexeno across uh, different uh, detectors, uh, different uh, colliders. We see that uh, here is, a, is a, actually this is a good place to compare with uh, you know compare 10 TeV muon collider with 100 TeV PP collider. Okay, so again they are, they should broadly, as I said, have the same similar kind of reach. But this is a difficult channel. You see that uh, 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 you know, muon collider at 10 TeV does have an advantage here. And the broad lesson we learned from uh, this set of study is that uh, with inclusive signal, the mono X signal, more model independent mono X signal, a, a, a muon collider running at about 14 TeV is, is enough to cover the lower dimensional multiplets. And if we do have the disappearing track, if we're lucky to, to, to have those, and it has the potential to actually reach 
half of the center of mass energy of the muon cloud. This is the ultimate reach. Okay, so last, I wanted to spend just a few minutes just talk about uh, one more case, which is a uh, flavor and the CP. And uh, I wanted mostly focusing on the complementarity between the muon collider searches and, uh, and other probes. And um, I, so why do we even think about uh, it's a good muon collider, you know, is a good place to look for flavor and CP other than, you know, why not? I think the 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 main uh, one of the main motivation is that the, the absence, you know, the, the current absence of any confirmed flavor and CP anomaly, um, points to a uh, give a pretty strong constraint on the scale of of flavor violation, pointing towards uh, the lambda flavor violation to be around the ten or tens of TeV already, and. Uh, so I think a muon collider at the same time running at high energies can both directly and indirectly probe this scale. So here is an example of probing lepton flavor violation at the muon colliders. So, so uh, the, this, this study is done by parametrizing lepton flavor violation with EFT operators. And uh, the horizontal, the vertical axis here is the, uh, an operator with, with one tau and the three mu. And the, 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 the horizontal axis here is the, the with the one mu and the three e. And the, the study is done by just probing, uh, uh, the study of muon collider reach is done by just probing the, 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 the mu to uh, one tau three mu operator by directly studying from the, the, the reach from the, the tau mu final state, uh, starting from mu mu uh, initial state. You see that again, uh, uh, high energy muon colliders actually have, uh, have quite uh, you know a decent reach and to 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 uh, probe these operators. I think more study probably has been more things has been has to be thought about how to probe the other operator as well with the non colliders. And the, these uh, these uh, diagonal lines are just uh, you know of course uh, um, you can either assume a, a complete flavor anarchy or you assume there's some onsets of this uh, Wilson coefficients. They, 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 these are the just to, these are the, the different models, if you want, the model lines. Okay. And then this is uh, not only uh, fully competitive and even uh, even better than the future generation of uh, B factories and so on. And uh, another interesting uh, probe will be EDMs. So <clears throat> I think uh, in the in the coming decades, there is a, you know, there has already been a lot of advance recently in terms of measuring <clears throat> the EDMs. And this is the, the, the precision one can expect to achieve in the, in the, in the near future. And, uh, and if we think of this coming from some kind of a two bar Z diagram, it points, it looks like this, it points to a scale of 20 TeV and from a process looks like this. Okay. And interestingly, this is, uh, I'm, I'm just going to add another uh, lepton to, to, to this diagram. This is exactly the same process that can, that can be probed at the at the muon colliders, okay. so that's a uh, will be will be highly complementary the search at muon colliders and the EDM measurement. Of course, you know muon since its birth is kind of special, right? As we all know. So what if uh, you know uh, muon the new physics just likes muon? Okay, so it just show up likes to show up in the muon. So there's some major finger crossing here. Okay, and. Uh, um, of course, when, if, if that's confirmed, I think we are really in a new era, and that there is really a dear, dear now. You know, it's a very definitive target. We need to go after that kind of new physics. I think a lot of the current uh, discussion of future colliders will probably has to be redone at that point. Okay, but nevertheless, since uh, this the the, the new physics uh, couples to muon, I think it's not it doesn't come as a surprise that the muon collider can do it. Of course. Okay, so it's, so I, I won't be able to get into any of the details. I think this slides from uh, <clears throat> or Rodolfo sum, sums uh, sums up this really great, and uh, and uh, you see that already at three TeV muon collider, it can probe a lot of these scenarios, and the ten TeV will be even better. Okay. Uh, okay. All right, so with that, I will I will conclude, and uh, so I think. Uh, Muon Collider is a, a very powerful machine at Energy Frontier with a, a very rich uh, 
physics programs, uh, physics programs, which I tried to demonstrate a little bit. And uh, um, it has a great uh, Higgs measurement. Uh, if the center of mass energy for muon collider is greater than 3 TeV, and it has a exciting reaches for a very broad spectrum of new physics in the range of uh, 10 TeV or tens of TeV. Okay, so it can test wimp dark matter. And I, I've shown you that the, it can perform interesting tests of wimp dark models and uh, uh, pushing forward uh, uh, naturalness and has great complementarity with a, a whole host of uh, flavor and CP uh, observables. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Lian Tao. I think uh, now it's time uh, for questions from, from the audience. Uh, I already see that uh, Michelangelo raises uh, his hand, so please, uh, Michelangelo. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Lian Tao. That, that was a very nice overview. Uh, but you started with a slide uh, where you said that uh, it was a very generic slide. And the bottom line of it was that the, 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 10 TV, the 14 TV muon collider is, uh, is equivalent uh, somehow to the 100 TV proton collider. And you also showed in many examples, you know, you, you were very careful in pointing out uh, where the new one collider can do better. I mean, of course, you could have given a whole seminar with your knowledge, picking uh, examples where, of course, nothing can beat the 100 TV proton collider. Right? And I can give you a very, very simple example in which the 10 TV new one collider cannot even beat the LHC because if we had uh, two and a half TV uh, gluinos and squarks, which are in principle within the reach of the LHC, you wouldn't be able to see them with a 10 TV uh, lepton-lepton collider, right? And there are many other examples like that. So I think that one really has to be, has to be fair because otherwise this message, which I keep now seeing repeated over and over and over again, becomes a mantra. And that is not very uh, good somehow for properly planning uh, our future, right? What do you think? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think I can only say I agree with, with the statement. And uh, uh, you know, I think uh, this is a, perhaps I wasn't doing a very good job, but this is what this naively and this squiggle means. Okay, so I think, and, uh, and obviously um, I think that the, as, as Michelangelo emphasized, uh, and the, 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 one should probably really uh, emphasize that, that there are complementary uh, parts of the FCC HH program and the, and the, and, and the muon collider program. Like the, the gluino is a, is a good, good, good example. It, it doesn't have a uh, electrical coupling. And, uh, so you, you can actually produce gluino uh, from uh, you know, a higher order processes, but the reach is much weaker. So, and uh, Anyways, but we can also, you know, I, I think, uh, I think, the, I agree that the message should be really, uh, it's complementary. I think I've been trying to be careful to say that uh, on this slide. Perhaps I wasn't doing a very good job. But Mion uh, uh, Collider is not. Uh, I don't want to say 10 TV Mion Collider is much better. It's a much better machine than a than 100 TV PP Collider. Even they are really complementary. Andrea. Please. Hello. No, I just wanted to mention that, uh, uh, like, uh, I don't think you said that uh, the Mion Collider 10 TV is better than the PP machine, but uh, you said, and it's true, that there is a number of uh, direct search targets, okay, which is somehow surprising because uh, if you come from an idea that the Lepton Collider is good for doing other things, where a Mion Collider, because of this energy, is actually better than the PP collider, okay? And there are candidates, as Michelangelo said, where it is uh, uh, not. But I don't think uh, uh, your statement was different than that, uh, which is a true statement. And another thing that somehow complements what you said is that what we think is that the muon collider is, uh, uh, in this sense, uh, a more complete exploration machine because it combines uh, um, a very good, now, comparable, better in some cases, worse in other cases, uh, direct reach with the possibility of doing uh, very precise measurements 
by vector boson fusion luminosity, which is huge, by an environment which is more, uh, which is more uh, friendly, and also doing measurements at high energy, which uh, uh, open other type of possibilities. So, um, right, I just wanted to say that uh, I agree that, of course, there are things that uh, you can do at the FCCHH only, as well as there are things you can do at the Ion Collider only. But uh, the real matter of the discussion should be what is the quickest machine that can do as many things as possible. And, uh, and a single project like the Muon Collider has an added value that comes from the fact that you can do several different things. Sorry, it was a bit long. Okay, there is a, there is a question uh, in the chat uh, from Glennis. She's asking, uh, what is the meaning of beta in the, in the slide that you are showing right now? Oh, the, 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 yeah, I, sh I should have said that. The, so, so obviously the, the com com comparison between the, the, these two colliders are, depends on uh, the, the, the precise production mode. So, so this is a, a, a attempt to capture some of it. So this is the beta is the ratio of the proton, uh, parton cross-section uh, and the, the, and the, the lepton parton cross-section. Okay, you see with bigger beta means that uh, there's a more advantage for, for proton collider to produce that. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the proton machine is a uh, 100 TeV, for example, is equivalent to a higher energy uh, muon collider. So it's going that way. Okay, so this is an attempt to, to somehow encapsula encapsulate a little bit about uh, the model dependence, which, which you know, probably is even more than this, but this is a way to, to showing some of the model dependence. Okay. Um, also, if you have a question for uh, for Daniel, uh, I think uh, of course you can ask. <laughs> yeah, should I stop sharing? I'll stop sharing. Uh, it's okay. Yanta, I think I have a question uh, for the case of uh, uh, direct searches for uh, WIMPs. Mm -hmm. So, so when the when the mass of, um, let's say, the thermal mass of WIMP is, is comparable with the center of mass, it does uh, play any role the fact that you can form bound states? So does this uh, modify? Right. So in principle, I think in principle it will. It will, especially at, uh, at uh, I think at, uh, for those very heavy WIMPs, the, the bound state formation is actually important, mediated by the, mm -hmm. by the actual gauge bosons. I, I think there has been some study already. I, I didn't have a space okay. to, to, to include that in my, my, my slides, but yeah, yes, indeed, I think. I have a question perhaps for Daniel. Huh? Um, so it, it uh, are there ideas, and uh, if you can say anything, something about them, that uh, uh, of uh, using these uh, uh, neutrinos coming from the beam uh, uh, to do neutrino physics, so to put a detector, uh, so uh, if you can say anything about uh, this. Um, well, uh, I think we, we don't have a clear idea, but obviously in direction of the detector straight, um, you would have a substantial number of uh, neutrinos. So um, to use them, I mean, to, to have some thought through way to use them would be uh, very, very good. And um, I think some people actually sort of loosely said it could be interesting, but we don't have <laughs> something serious uh, in the moment which, uh, which would exploit them. But yeah. Wouldn't it help the physics case if you, if I can add, uh, say, an interior experiment? Uh, on top of yeah. the high energy one. Yeah, no, I mean, if somebody has a good idea of what exactly is required, um, we would certainly integrate it and in design. So. Thank you. Yeah, there is, is a that, question uh, in the chat for Daniel. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, so what's the proposed timeline for the American collaboration? Ah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is a good question. I don't think they, they have, well, they, they started talking to it. I think the, the timeline that we had is more or less technically limited. So it would be similar in the US. If the US were going to, to go ahead, I think it would, yeah, would be at the same time. And I think that's what they, also what they think. Now, I'm not yet sure if there's a, like an official opinion 
or at least the opinion of uh, the experts I have been talking to in the US. Okay. Like Mark Palma and others. Yeah. Uh, there is a, a question by yeah, Juan. Uh, I have a question about the repeated coverage of the muon detector. So uh, now uh, it seems in order to reduce the beam induced background, we want to put a shielding nozzle in the interaction point that will limit the rapidity like a 10 degree shielding nozzle like rapidity mm -hmm. 2.5. I wonder if it's still possible to put the detector in the very forward region like uh, uh, what uh, click is uh, discussed maybe rapidity yep. five to seven uh, i don't know if somebody from the detector is here but otherwise um i will answer uh, yes the most of the background actually is softer particles it's uh, shower products from electrons and uh, positrons so if you are looking for example if you want to take muons down to small angles that should be possible because there you, you still should be able to distinguish them from the background. So, so this needs to be explored, but I think a concept similar to the click one uh, can be followed and it may even be somewhat easier because after all it's, if you tag the muon from like uh, the initial state, um, then it should be even easier, hopefully. I don't know if somebody from Donatella's team is around and can give you a more detailed answer. Okay. <laughs> Maybe not. But I can answer that. Uh, hi, everybody. I can answer that we can think of instrument the nozzle, but uh, this is this is, needs uh, some simulation, detailed simulation, mm. and careful studying. But uh, it can be, can be envisaged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think in general, we, we should uh, not forget what we were starting with is the nozzle design that came from the map study. And there are a few things that um, one needs to explore in order to, uh, to see if it can be further improved. For example, if you, um, if first of all, if there is a better way to contain the background coming from the um, machine in there to avoid that something bounces in, in this inner bore into the detector. And then, for example, um, maybe it's naive, but for me, it's not clear since the a part of the background comes from going through the nozzle uh, hole and then hitting the nozzle on the other side and bouncing back. Um, and therefore, it is a bit out of time and out of direction. It may actually be interesting to see what happens if the, the nozzles are shorter. If, if you move these points away from the IP, maybe the background rate goes somewhat up, but the background is more easily distinguishable from the main events. So this type of exploration study needs to be done, and that's obviously time consuming to check carefully the different, uh, different options. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I think not. So if not, I think uh, we can uh, we can close here. Yeah, I think it's been a really nice discussion. Uh, very interesting. So yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you to the to the speaker. Thank you, Leon Tao and Daniel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a, uh, have a good night. Have good a nice day or evening. <laughs> good good evening. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.